Uh, welcome all to the KSA lecture series for the spring under the topic of economy. This lecture is a special one. Um, this lecture, along with the previous lecture of Beatrice Colomina, are part of a, of a small series that has been put together in collaboration between the KSA and the film department uh, as an opportunity to explore common areas of interest. Um, I am actually here simply to introduce the format, and we'll turn the mic over for the introduction proper to my collaborator, John Davidson, who's the head of the film department here and also an associate professor in the German department. So with that, John. Thanks very much, John. Uh, tonight's speaker, Chris Lukenbiel, holds an F a BS, an MA, and a PhD in geography and is the director of the Masters of Advanced Study in Geographic Information Systems at Arizona State University. For the last 17 years, Chris has conducted interdisciplinary research on film and media and geography, examining the roles of things like masculinity, scale and hysteria in film, cinematic landscapes, the relationship between music and cartography in Havana, geographic media literacy, and the question of what exactly is film geography. Chris's primary focus is on locational filming and how it intersects with political economy, hence the link into the larger series, cultural theory, and critical landscape theory. This brought him to be the lead editor of The Geography of Cinema, a Cinematic World, an anthology published by uh, Steiner Verlag in 2008, and one of the three founding editors of, uh, of Ether, the Journal of Media Geography. It's really a remarkable open source e-journal, um, and I'd like to use actually Chris's own words written with his co-editors, Jim Crane and Jason Dittmer, to describe that project just a little bit. One of the main reasons we developed Ether as an e-journal was to offer authors alternative publishing outlets, something that went beyond the textual format of both traditional hard journals and text-based e-journals. We want color. We want sound and animated video. We want photo essays and interactive media. The types of research that have a value to media geography, that indeed define media geography, but that are often forced into a compromise by the constraints of normative publishing. All too often, we remain wedded to textuality when it comes to presenting our research. However, as we move further into a world of advanced capitalism, driven by new information technologies and spaces of flow, Streams of innovations, knowledge, and ideas are increasingly circulated in non-textual formats. We strongly encourage and support the use of multimedia productions in our journal, and we hope that we can offer an acceptable venue for those seeking to transcend and even transgress the knowledge-limiting restraints of traditional academic publications. The Film and Architecture Initiative was started with just this in mind, productively crossing over the limits of traditional academic enterprise. So I'm particularly happy that Chris is here today to help us step beyond those limits with the architectonics of a cinematic city on location film in San Diego. Please join me in welcoming Chris Lucas. Thank you, John. I hope I handled the clicker correctly. Um, for those of you that don't know him, I'm dedicating this presentation to Dr. Larry Ford, who just passed away last year. He was an urban geographer and very influential in, in my early work on in um, San Diego geography, um, very well-known and uh, uh, respected urban geographer. But, but first off, you think, San Diego, the cinematic city? Well, yes, San Diego, and I didn't have a slide on it, so I just wanted to tell you really briefly um, during the 1990s, San Diego was the third largest producer of television shows in the United States. And if you throw in Vancouver, it would be the fourth largest in North America. So they have had and continue to have a large production base, especially in television and uh, to a lesser extent feature films. As a general introduction, I thought, uh, since the, the, the focus was on film and architecture, that we would look a little bit at some of the, the quotes about the relationship between the two. The first being, 
the art that's closest to cinema is architecture. And from Essenstein, film's undoubtable ancestor is architecture. Architecture and cinema have natural inbuilt affinities, plan, construction, script, production, architects, and film directors pr proceed down parallel routes to create works. And this is sort of a montage effect of uh, a building um, using film design. Juliana Bruno, of course, Cinema defines itself as an architectural practice. It is an art form of the street, an agent in building city views. And who can't forget the famous quote, where's the cinema? It's all around you, outside, all over the city, the marvelous continuous performance of films and scenarios. So what I'd like to focus on begins with Vidler's comment that film and architecture have this complex relationship with regards to spatial visual representation and the mixing of the two. That they both deal with the subject matter, but they deal with it in different ways and in very similar ways. So I examine how spatial visual representations are theorized through two different modes of logic. First is the inscriptive mode of logic, which I'll, I'll get into some detail on. And the second is an incorporative mode of logic. And both of these affect our understanding of the relationships between film and architecture. Or I should say, reflect the relationships between film, architecture, and for me, on location filming. And if you didn't recognize this, this was all the Ho Del Hotel or the Hotel Del Coronado. So, using an incorporative mode of logic is what I'm mainly going to do with this presentation. And I'm going to probe what I call the task scape, or what Tim Ingold has called the task scape that continually generates the form of San Diego's cinematic city. On location filming transforms physical sites into fragmented narrative places. And as Heath has mentioned, fragmentation predicates narrative continuity. It does so by fusing the spectator with the film itself, creating a superior unity. It allows filmic space to be realized with the spectator as part of that space. And yes, Bring It On was in San Diego. Actually, this was filmed at San Diego State when I was a, a grad student. A little bit about the, the data, the empirics um, that come, that lead to this project in general. Um, I've been working or ha been working with the San Diego Film Commission since about 1996 off and on um, and did in-depth interviews primarily with their three lead, there's been some changing in staff, but with their three lead uh, film commissioners. Kathy Anderson, who's the CEO and the main primary film commissioner for San Diego. Um, Kathy McCurdy, who's the director of feature films. And Rob Dunson, uh, the director of television shows and television movies. And also the past location scout for Stu Seagal Productions, which is the largest producer of television shows and movies. And probably about 30% of feature films in San Diego since 1989. What I did as a geographer and also being a person that dabbles with GIS and cartography was I dug through these just monstrous rows of file cabinets 
and pulled out all in any locational data, especially location lists, location notes, um, and uh, took photographs of everything, or just sat there for about, I'd say about eight months, and entered, or what we call geocoded, took this data and entered it into Excel set spreadsheets and then address matched it so it had its spatial attributes associated with it and created this GIS or Geographic Information System database. And this database represents 1,781 individual sites, but a site can be used more than once. So it in total represents 3,700 and 81 individual on-location filming events. And the data, it represents uh, about a 20-year period. Trying to get, there's a few films that I have that go before 1985, um, but data records were not kept quite as well um, before then. And then after 2005, the way that they kept records has changed um, significantly. And also, as well as their funding is no longer from the, the city of San Diego, but is funded directly through uh, um, the Hotel and Conventions Bureau and uh, the filling of, of putting people into hotels. So it's, it's really changed the way that they keep track of data. In terms of field research and in terms of architecture, then I spent a summer and toured all these sites. Well, I'd say maybe not all of them, maybe about 80%. I, wanted, I hit all of the major sites that were most frequently filmed and then anything that was along the way. So I'd say about 70, 80% of all sites I went through and took photographs of them. Well, first we can talk about inscriptive logic. And this is focuses on site, the voyeur, and the immobile spectator. From Ingold, thinking of inscription, we can think about a, of a pre-existing pattern, something that is realized in a substantive form, an object, if you will. So an object or the medium, how that substantive form comes about, could be a building, a film, or an architecture in film. The representation frames this logic, and it prioritizes um, messed up. So with inscription, Form is prioritized over the process that generates form. In scriptive logic, we can also think about trends in film studies as well as film architecture studies. And um, from Shields' book, um, he quote, and I, this isn't a direct quote, but film studies has tended to focus on the textuality or the textual metaphor, especially in film geography, um, or as a reflection of society. Film architecture, similarly, has, um, as Newman claims, has had three focuses. First being that it reflects and comments on current developments such as in Sunshine State, where they're looking at um, the logic of redeveloping um, a, an urbanized, or a, a non-urbanized area on the beach to becoming much more of an urbanized area. As a testing ground for new visions. And as a mean to realize architectural arts and practices, such as in Blade Runner. So with all of these, with either film architecture or with film studies, form is already realized, a priori. It naturalizes 
the real imaginary or the material, non-material binary up front. And it privileges, it gives hegemonic power to the real, to the material, where the immaterial and the imaginary come secondary. Inscriptive logic we can trace back to animated photography, or if you want to think of early actualities, the early days of, of filmmaking, where filmic space really lacks depth in terms of the spectator's relationship with the film itself. The, the, the spectator itself is displaced from that space or that architectural site or site. Viewers here focus on the totality, totality of the image, a representation of space that affords the subject a position of apparent mastery by aligning vision with truth. In this sense, animated photography is a representation of actual or staged instances of the world as seen something that we see out there in the world. On the other hand, if we're talking about incorporative logic, it's a means to explore cinema and architectural processes through the generation of form itself. It precedes the referential system of representation with a relational ontology that Im of embodied movement and taskscapes where form is perpetually in flux. In this sense, cinema and architecture resonate a kinesthetic experience and an emotional effect. And by that I mean it's both emotion it's given as cinema as emotion and the aspect of motion that is given through narrative cinema. With architecture and film as a noun, we inscribe meaning onto form. If we were to take architecture and film as a verb, we would incorporate meaning into the production of the form. So if we're thinking about the shift between animated photography and narrative cinema, it occurs through montage and movement, where the apparatus of cinema itself could both manipulate and manufacture space and, and time. And in so doing, it ceased to be a referential system, something that was bound to the real. It became a simulacrum free to fabricate its own reality effects. Narrative cinema shifts the spectator, spectatorial experience from the voyeur or voyeurism and optics to a voyager inhabiting a particular haptical cartography. And I take you on, I love this is Paris, I love you, and I'm not going to try my French out today. And to me, this is a classic example of haptical cartography, where you're taken on a tour of 18 different um, districts. I don't know the, I can't pronounce the French term for di the districts. And through this haptical cartography, it's an emotional journey as well as a journey through sites and of icons that represent each of these different 18 districts. This gets us to the taskscape of on-location filming, part of an incorporative logic. 
So with the Tascape, the focus is on the kinesthetic activities that are inherent in business practices that generate the form of the product itself as well as the experience of that form. So with the business practices of on-location filming, we're combining labor, the actual production process, and a site, a location, to create a filmic space. And also, the viewer's experience of that combined um, um, activity, if you will. So in this sense, cinema becomes a lived space. It's inhabited by a taskscape of production and the haptic mobility of the spectator as a voyager. So in San Diego, nearly every day, and I do mean this uh, currently, Somewhere, somebody is filming, which is continually reproducing the cinematic city. The cinematic city resonates through this movement, as well as through the montage effect of film style. It's an architectural pr practice. It's a flow or a plenium. The camera actually articulates this architectural ensemble by tying it to a linear na narrative. It produces a, a simulated city shot by shot, or I should say narrative place by narrative place linked together. And it's th through the look of architecture and of landscapes itself that are the essential reason why on location or, or locational filming takes place. That these are something that are unique out there in the urban environment or the non-urban environment that can't be recreated in a studio or just doesn't give you that same sense of texture, of feel, of aesthetics that you can get there or on a back lot. You ever notice on a back lot when they shoot New York City where there's always a dead end street and then you get into New York City and you rarely find streets that meet at 90 degree angles. So, central to the task of on location filming is the concept of production value. If we think of production value as being a perceived value of the finished product itself, of the film when it's released. And production value could be purchased, we could find it, or we could create it through film style. You probably know the Bradbury building through many different movies as well as it's frequently used in commercials. So site selection that aids in giving production value interrelates many different elements and I wanted to kind of go through and talk about these different elements. First, the needs of the script and these are sort of somewhat listed in, in order, but I'd say the script and the budget are the most primary uh, essential elements of site selection. But the needs of the script, the aesthetics of the location itself, the budget of the individual production that's being created, accessibility to a site, how well is the site uh, dressed or propped or ready to be propped? The idea of multifunctionality, and I was toying with the idea of calling it heterotopical, but it's a little bit different than heterotopias or heterot heterotopics. And as well, the use of establishing space, and this is linked 
to establishing shots and reestablishing shots. So let's start with the needs of the script. Rob Dunson told me in an interview, the script usually drives everything. Stroke of a pen, as they say. Stroke of the pen and you're looking for the Taj Mahal. Imagine trying to find the Taj Mahal in San Diego. Kathy McCurdy comments that if I get a script and it calls for a police station, I'm not going to run down to the police department and ask to film there. I'm going to go out and match what looks like a government building that is accessible. And most often she'll recommend the county administration building because first off, the county is film friendly. Second, it's a public property, so it's fee free, so it saves on budget. And also, it's accessible. There's lots of parking down there. In terms of aesthetic, we can think of the spectacle of the aesthetics of location, the extravagance. That went a little too fast for me. Let's try it again. The spectacle, the extravagance, the texture, or historical realism in terms of adding value to production. And all of these locations, and I think it's cutting off over here. No, it's showing up up there, all right. All of these locations, other than the uh, trolley station, were used quite frequently. Um, if you get a chance to go to San Diego, I uh, recommend go to the Below nightclub, look it up. And one of the reasons why it's filmed, not only for its interiors, but San Diego has a lack of alleys. And it has its own private alley entrance where you drop down in and ascend into this small little private alley. And so they can shoot one way in the alley and they can turn around and shoot the other way and they can get a two-shot sequence, two different alleys all together, plus the extra extravagance of the interior. I'm trying to think of the bad movie that was filmed at the trolley station. Had Sylvester Stallone in a future role. What was that? The, the no, no, Demolition Man, Demolition Man. Yeah, do you recognize it from the? <laughs> so, like the use of using major stars for a production, location can also offer production value through its own showmanship. And I didn't notice, I didn't note this in, an, in another slide, but it's interesting that a majority of the films out of my um, entire database are infrequently filmed. There's only a handful of places that are used more than 20 times. Most places are used less than five times. That producers want to be like explorers, they want their production designers, their location scouts, to find something that's new, unique, to be the first person that gets that showmanship onto the screen. The next aspect of production value, the budget, and I'll give you a comparison here. The most expensive place to film in San Diego you could probably imagine it's the Hotel Del Coronado. Filmed only seven times. And I had to go back to some like it hot to even get the and, and the stunt man as you saw earlier. I had to go back to the 50s and 70s to get part of my seven in that. But after this success of some like it hot, they saw a sh uh, the Del Coronado as well as the city of Coronado saw a sharp increase in production. 
So now, roughly, it's about $10,000 to film in the Dell for one day. And that's if you want to use the, the central lobby. It's even more. A lot of places like the Dell, or like if you think of uh, the San Diego Zoo, um, or other major tourist attractions that have regular attendance, regular viewers, or, or regular visitors, regular voyagers, that it's hard for them to shut down to allow for film production to take place because it's not really adding business to it, it's actually taking away business from it. So in some ways, they're almost like competing for spectator, spectatorial ship that they're, or for the consumption of uh, the image or the event that's going on. Kathy McCurdy commented to me that the city of Coronado basically is doing everything it can to discourage filming. Unless it's a high production, it means you know, big box office, a big hit, they're discouraging small films from going there. They have, it's an independent city, so they have their own permitting process that you have to take it all the way through city council, and you have to pay a fee for it, and you have to pay a fee for their locations within the city, and this works completely different than any other city in the San Diego County area. So most productions just don't have the time or the money to go through this process. On the other hand, we can look at the most filmed site in San Diego, Balboa Park, a public park, filmed 106 times. Actually, it was filmed, I had it documented as filmed even more frequently than Stu Seagal's studio, which is the largest studio facility in San Diego. By policy, public properties that are owned by the city of San Diego, by the port district, or by the county are fee free which encourages filming. I actually got to see uh, Spike Lee Joint do one of his commercials at Balboa Park. That was about the only film event that I've seen at Balboa Park. Uh, but filming at Balboa Park actually is one of the um, most historic uh, locations as well, dating back to its original construction. Even though things are fee free, productions do have to pay what's called cost recovery. That means that they have to pay for security, they have to pay for maintenance, and if there's any sort of operational costs associated with um, blocking off or cleaning up afterwards, um, they have to pay those costs. The next item, accessibility. Sites, any site, if you're thinking of a television show, television movie, a feature film, it's not just somebody with a little hand cam. There's large semi-trucks with lots of equipment, the star vehicles coming in. So can they get those big trucks to these sites? Is there accessibility for all that equipment and all that transportation supplies? Well, one lo location, or I should say one type of location that offers accessibility and is repeatedly used is what's called a standing set. And a standing set provides ample parking, but it also provides constant accessibility to that site. And it does so because the film production company, or the, or the production company in general, signs a long-term contract agreement with either the personal property owner or at the Naval Training Center, um, which was part of the base closure initiative and is now run by the city of San Diego. Um, they signed an agreement with the city of San Diego to have access. 
So it allows, especially television series, to repeatedly use the same site over and over again so that it establishes a narrative place that they can return to, that the whole series can kind of be you know, situated around. And we'll look at, I'll show you a little more about the Marina Village Conference Center. Um, Naval Training Center was used only once by Top Gun and about 13 times by other television shows, all related to Stu Seagal. It's interesting, if you, if you know the book um, by Mayer of, of on-location filming, one of the central points that he'll make is that um, noisy places are not good locations to film at because they, they cause all kinds of problems. You know where the Naval Training Center is? It's right at the end of the runway of Lindbergh Field. I mean, right at the end of the runway. So and I said, well, how do you get around this? You know, asking the film commission. And, and they said, well, we get a guy, and they have uh, little turret towers, and they'll put them with binoculars and get the cell phones out, and they'll tell them, OK, you can start filming. OK, you can stop filming now. OK, you can start, or you can stop. So this, this idea of, of noise being an issue, yes, it is. But in some places, it can be mitigated. Another theme for production value is props and dressing. And dressing is the term that I found was most commonly used in my interviews. This is, uh, if you think of uh, dramatic narratives, especially movies of the week, but also feature films, television shows, you can think that there's a very frequent need to have a hospital of some kind or another. And if you don't have a studio set that's fully propped for a hospital, then you need to find an on-location place to film a hospital. And going back to Mayer's on-location filming guide, he says that hospitals are one of the most difficult places to film at because they're hard to find. Well, in San Diego, the Bayview Medical Center was filmed 56 times. It was in the top five locations in terms of filming. Why is that? Well, in the 1990s, it went bankrupt. And it closed down, completely closed for five years. <coughs> Kathy McCurdy said that it was as if the marshals came in one night and just locked the doors. No one ever walked into that hospital again. Literally fully propped and dressed, Pictures of people's kids still on their desks. So you can imagine that the hospital looked like it was just abandoned, just as is. Filming at the Bayview Medical Center, just as a side comment, uh, primarily took place in the 1990s. And um, I saw that the, it started to run out of production in 2002. And my most current Google Earth inquiry on Street View was showing that the whole building's for sale right now. So McCurdy points out that everything you can imagine if you're an art department that you would need to prop a hospital scene was already there and ready to be filmed. Well, Rob Dunson as the tapering off of the use of Bayview Medical Center started to occur, needed a second hospital. So he took a, a physician from the Sharp Cabrillo Hospital over to Bayview to show him how filming could be done without disrupting the normal da daily functions of a hospital. And now he claims that he has both. He's got a newer looking hospital, which would be the Sharp Cabrillo, which was a fairly recent construction. And he's got the older hospital look, too. And um, I haven't seen any filming at Sharp 
or at Bayview Medical Center since 2004, but um, I haven't checked the most current data. Multifunctionality comprises a, a couple of different aspects. First, we're talking about where a site can be used for different scenes. So it has a multiple functions to that same place. And I give you the Marina Village Conference Center as the example. The second one is where sites that are in close proximity can be used in the same narrative so that you don't have to do a lot of moving around. You can set up in one location and hey, right next door I can use that or right next door I can use that. Um, and the one example I'm not going to give that was highly filmed is uh, the Belmont Park at Mission Beach where the common comment, common comment was with the turn of the camera I could have the ocean, the sand, the boardwalk, a roller coaster, a lively streetscape, a green park, a bay, all within less than a quarter mile. Let's take a look at a site used for different uses. Well, the Marina Village Conference Center offers these sort of small cottage spaces, which I'll show you is, which there's, uh, one of these was rented out by Renegade. There's also these unique textures that it's not all the same architecture throughout the complex. It also has propped restaurant spaces, and three of them to be exact, um, with different harbor views to be used. So again, we don't have to go in and prop and dress it. There's also lush landscape areas that surround the complex itself. And of course, you have the marina sitting right there. So not only just the marina, but you can film on the boats if you contract with the private boat owner. Finally, right next to it, and there's the lush landscape and just where you see the green, that's the Marina Village Conference Center. But there's this long road, Quiviera Way, that parallels Mission, uh, the Mer Marina Village Conference Center and then to the left, you get this dirt path, and then there's the San Diego River. They love to use this desolate road for these action scenes. And they've had many car chase and car blow up scenes out here because it's very easy to close off the road and not have a lot of, of um, interference with traffic or other issues. The second one that we're going to look at is sites in close proximity that are used in the same narrative. So let's go back to the Bayview Medical Center and put it in a context here. Well, the Bayview Medical Center is sort of this multiple site or collection of sites, if you will, that it includes Grant Hill Park, which I've labeled there for you, and it goes all the way over to that basketball court on the other side of the hill on the I guess that would be to the east, and the Bayview Medical Center is on the west, and also the streetscapes in between. As Rob Dunson explains, the first set of the day would be at the Grand Hill Park, where they'd set up minimal amounts of equipment, they could do um, intimate dialogue scenes. Then while they're doing that, they could go into the hospital, set up the hospital, prepare for the rehearsing of the hospital scenes. And when the last hospital shots are done and they're breaking down the equipment, they get the street work ready. And they go out and shoot the streets, shoot the, the chase scenes of the cars leaving the hospital or, or whatever. And as he says, and I loved this comment, that it's a real fine choreographic day of shooting. It's a shared responsibility uh, to make sure that happens properly. 
So it's not just the choreography of the production as what we see in the film, but it's also the ta choreography within the taskscape itself that, that makes um, the incorporative logic. Finally, we can think of multifunctionality. And I could have given a, I'll give you two examples, uh, two more generic examples, and then maybe if, we, if there's time, I'll give you some specific ones. But sites that are used to double for other locations, and I wrote once that um, this, this is what geographers often um, common as the crimes against geography, where um, San Diego often and very frequently uh, substitutes for Florida in many different productions. And one common way of doing it, and you've probably seen this, is to establish a location by license plating. Let's just show them a license plate, and then that'll say, where are you? I'm in Florida, right? But you can also think of productions that represent Florida, that have been filmed in San Diego. Pensacola, Wings of Gold. Well, that's Pensacola, Florida. Silk Stockings, which was the longest running television series in San Diego. Um, I think it went for eight, nine years. Uh, it was supposed to be uh, Palm Beach. And a lot of people forget, but some like it hot, the Del Coronado Hotel was supposed to be in Florida. It wasn't supposed to be in, in um, San Diego. So I asked a number of different, uh, I asked the, all the film commissions and a couple of, of location scouts, where do you find Florida and San Diego? You know, it seems kind of like an odd geographic question to ask. And the first comment is always, well, it's anywhere where the sand meets the beach. You know, that we're always asked to match that Miami look, that Art Deco color. We just don't have it. So here is San Diego's Florida, particularly La Jolla and especially South La Jolla. And if you wanted to go look for it, go to the Camino de la Costa Boulevard where the, there's a little park. It's the top, or this shot right here, and the top shot as well where the road meets the beach and the lines of the palm trees and the rocky shorelines coming right up to the beach. And I'm like, this is Florida? <laughs> but this is San Diego's Florida. Second way of thinking about doubling and as a geographer using um, GIS and mapping and taking, having taken all those photographs, I went through, and I'm just going to give you one example, of trying to map the urban back lots of San Diego. And I shouldn't say just urban because some of them are rural, and I'm going to show you the rural ones here. And what I did was I looked at land use. Imagine like doing a land use classification. Well, I did a cinematic land use classification. I looked for clusters of film sites that had the same architectural or landscape characteristics. And by characteristics, I typically mean the look, if they have a similar look and feel to them. So here we're out in the uh, eastern county, which is typically much more rural. This is the, the more non-urbanized areas. And there was two uh, backlots, and here they're called regions that I classified, the rustic small town and the western ranch. So here's images of what the western ranch would look like. Sort of a, uh, you get more of the, the pine top um, look. This does not look like your typical San Diego. Um, western ranch also includes Hakumba, which is way out in the east and is right up against the Mexican border. And if you get there, that also can double for Mexico very easily. And then you get the rustic small town. And Pine Valley is a town that was uh, very frequently filmed. There's about 18 different locations all along the main street 
that they would start with the, uh, I think it's, it's a Majors Coffee Shop. I can't read it from here. It was Majors Coffee Shop, the top one. They'd start at the coffee shop, and then they'd work their way down the street and then end at the Pine Valley Lodge, which I didn't have on the map here. It's interesting to note that San Diego is unique in terms of its diversity of looks. It's very similar to Los Angeles, or you know, if you think of the history of why did film production go to LA, was partially a diversity of looks. That you can have a coastal environment, a marine environment, it could be 50 degrees at the beach and overcast. You go 15 minutes inland, it's 70 to 80 degrees and sunny. You got suburbias, you got small towns. Um, you can have uh, the old rail line trolley towns. You go a little bit further inland, you get these sort of small rustic towns, but you can climb up to the point where you will have snow-topped peaks in the winter. Finally, I wanted to end with establishing space. And this is Transformers, if you will, the classic establishing shot. So through establishing shots, we're creating sort of locational cues that build what I'm calling a cognitive map, even though as a geographer these aren't truly cognitive maps. Um, but they're cognitive maps that filmmakers are creating that help to guide the viewer's attention and their expectations of where things are going to occur and also what might occur at that location. So it organizes the spatial relations and it maintains continuity between these disparate narrative scenes and these disparate scenes locations, or what I'm calling narrative places. And as Heath in Questions on Cinema comments, that this is literally the transition from filmic space to narrative place, or from scene, S-E-E-N, to S-C-E-N-E, -E, from scene to scene. Reestablishing shots sort of function in the same way, but they don't need the same amount of specificity. And you typically find this in television shows, where rather than the grand overview of the city, where we hit all the tourist icons, or we hit the skyline, we're going to just give you, as in silk stockings, here's, and you can barely see on the side of the car, it says Palm Beach Police, and there's their police station. And just so that you know, uh, within a quarter mile, right around the corner, of Stu Seagal's facility. So for all the interiors, they just go to the studio to film. And I just went there last summer to get the photo of what it was currently, and it's now a Kaiser Medical Building. Um, and before it was the Daily Corporate Center, back when they, uh, Silk Stockings was filming it. So through establishing, or I should say through reestablishing shots, that we're reaffirming positionality within the cognitive map. And we're doing this through a series of repetition, that we're repeating the same locations, that we know what to expect, we know that there's something there, what's, what's going to go on. So for instance, the Marina Village Conference Center being the standing set, that we, that's uh, the office of Bobby Six Killers, the bounty hunter that Renegade works for. So you frequently see him pulling up there in, in Bay City, California. So television series often replace the classic establishing shot with those montage sequences that occur at the beginning of this, any and every show. And you all know what I'm talking about if you've seen these. That they'll tell you, they'll give you a little sense of the space, but I'd call it much more of a social space, that they're giving you the action and the location at the same time, of something that is seen. And 
of the voyeur, of the immobile spectator. If you think of uh, Plato's cave metaphor for you film studies people. And this drives out of the old actualities where the viewer's focus is on the totality of the image itself, on, on looking for reality, looking for the real. On the other hand, if we look at an incorporative mode of logic, we're focusing on the processes that generate the form. In this case, the spectator becomes a voyager rather than a voyeur. They're inhabiting and participating in a haptical and an emotional cartography. And yes, I'm using cartography not as a metaphor, and if there's time, I'll show you what I mean. Central to the, inc the incorporation logic is the taskscape, and it's where labor and sight generate form, as well as where the experience by the spectator feels and experiences the form. So, in Finally, essential to the taskscape itself is production value. And we looked at a number of different examples of that. So you tell me. Do, do, you, want the, do you want the extra? Or? Well, I think there might be some questions at this point. Okay. Yeah. Does it, does yeah. it um, mitigate the illusion effect? Or how do those mm -hmm. sort of issues get worked out in, in the perceptual realm? My, my answer to that is, in, in the original paper that this is based on, I had this whole section that talked about the topologies of place and how places can exceed their topology, and this was based on the idea of terrorism, that like the, uh, a certain act of terrorism can resonate an effect that's greater than the site. Or other types of events will not resonate as much. They'll resonate less so. And I started to deploy that with the idea that sites that would be recognizable as San Diego are things that exceed the scale or effect. But what I started to find was that individual locations like the police station of Silk Stockings. I had a gal email me from Florida um, that knew about my research and was just dying to get a picture of the Silk Stockings police station. And so I went through my databases and I sent her a couple different photos and we finally both figured out exactly which building it was. And so what I found was is that resonance was, was, was personal and subjective at some levels. And that it was hard to say or to make a, a generalization or a classification on what is recognized by whom. Because then do I say are the tourist attractions, the, the icons that ground the cognitive map for San Diego? 
What about for locals? The, the, the most frequently filmed sites in San Diego, in Balboa Park might be more internationally recognized, were local regional sites that might not be recognized in Ohio, but were, would be highly recognized in San Diego and maybe in the, in the uh, Southwest. Like the US Grant Hotel, uh, Belmont Park, Crystal Pier, these uh, all are very historic sites that have, that have this really unique texture and feeling. Um, but, other but other people might not recognize them. So I had this difficulty where it became a subjective, fluid kind of element, more than it was a, a, that you could kind of pin it down. Yeah. I go back to the quote that Kathy McCurdy said, that it has nothing to do with reality. That, uh, that, that in film, form doesn't follow everyday life function. That in film, the function follows the locational look and how well those two are matched. So production value increases as the locations are better matched for the scenes. So in, in terms of, and this gets to me to the concept of what I call geographic realism, is how well have you established geographic realism? And it doesn't, and Renegade can do it quite well um, for many places. And then other times I've seen him shoot Oregon and see palm trees. And I'm like, what the heck? You know? So a lot of times in scripts in, in San Diego and LA, they put NPT, no, no palm trees. Um, and they, or they try to make them look like telephone poles. So uh, the, the idea of authenticity is more, I think, tied to the, what I get to is, is, uh, of geographic realism, is how well you can you know, create realism. I don't, I, I think San Diego has had issues with it, um, with it being um, in, in the film industry be, because it looks so much like Los Angeles. And so it always has like, why should we go there when we have everything that we have here? But. At the same time, when they, the people that go to film, like um, Steven, Steven Soderbergh, did traffic in San Diego and used authentic locations and place-based things, that, or where uh, the film Mr. Wrong went there, and they used very specific, or if you think of Anchorman, where, where they used very specific, or Antoine Fisher, um, those are very much tied to the San Diego and the and I think Antoine Fisher did an excellent job of doing it as well. So no, I don't think that there's that issue. It's does the does the script match well with the place?
see it again. Think of a number of different ways to answer a question. First off, I always think correlation is regression, so I, I didn't do any regression analysis and, um, because it's, it's all subjective. But uh, one thing that does apply a lot with television, at television shows and television movies, and even with low budget feature films, so that's about 99% of what goes on in San Diego, um, is the idea of narrative formulas. And, um, and uh, in one of the interviews I did with Kathy McCurdy, uh, the features director, she'll get a call from a producer f for a typical television movie of the week, and they'll say, and she'll ask, is this a typical television movie of the week? And she'll say, okay, then you're going to need a hospital, you're going to need a condo on the beach, you're going to need some street work. You know, she can name like 10 sites, types of sites that they'll need, and they'll say, bingo, you hit 9 out of 10. But the specific location has, would be determined by the script and how that they want to use the script, the movement of the characters within the scenes. You know, do they need two mansions side by side? Do they need um, a swimming pool with it? Do they not? That, that kind of a thing. Is that, is that kind of what you're getting at? Um, when, and that's the part of the, the talk that I didn't do, is that I have a whole um, talk that just follows what I'd call an, an inscriptive mode of logic, which is all based on GIS analysis of locations. And if you take that map there as I showed it just for fun scenery for you to look at, but um, if you take that map there, what you're looking at is the orange is a kernel density overlay that's showing the amount of filming that's occurring. It's taking, it basically takes points and, and um, turns them into kind of like rasters, so that gives the extent. So the, the higher the point, the more the filming that's going on. Um, that blue, or that light blue circle, is what's called a standard deviational ellipse. So that represents, and the little kind of silo in the center is the mean center for all the film production. So it's 70, and within a one standard deviational ellipse, you typically expect to find 68% of all, all points of any kind in the, the math of or spatial analysis. In San Diego, you find over 73, 74%. And that area, just by knowing it, is the primary urban, urbanized area. So in San Diego, yes, the, the highly urbanized areas are much more film. And then beyond that, it becomes much more uh, script driven and, and the, the, the look of the film and the budget of the film that it's, it's really tough to kind of nail it down much more than that. Well, we have some uh, scenes and incentives to check out in Columbus, so thank mm -hmm. you for the lecture. And sure.